Cellaring wine and seeing how it evolves is one of the joys of wine appreciation. That tannin skeleton just mellows slowly over time and becomes more seamless with the fruit. Get some pointers from Sir Hugo chief winemaker Peter Munro in season 11 of this podcast. Somewhere where the temperature is consistent, it's yeah. fresher, more balanced, aging yeah. under screw cap. And the magnums were brighter, fresher, looking in better condition. Sir Hugo Cabernet is a mainstay of many Australian sellers. And now you can get your hands on some of the most outstanding back vintages, carefully selected by Peter. It opens up a breadth of wine knowledge and wine experience that a lot of consumers haven't had because they haven't had the ability to sell these wines or they haven't had the self-control to not drink the wines that they've bought. <laughs> St Hugo's Fine and Rare Collection, available now, direct from sithugo.com. Cabernet tends to be the sort of Errol Flynn of the great variety. To meet a global bartending legend. That's probably the gin that will open doors for us on the export market. Great single malt whiskey is made in the brewery. Conventional winemakers who just condemn all natural wine as faulty. Exploded onto the Australian brewing scene. Gin is such a fun way to be able to talk to people about different produce. Start focusing on the main ingredient in beer, which is water. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson, and this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Hello and welcome to a new year for the Drinks Adventures podcast. If you're a regular listener to the show, you'd recognise that we spend a lot of time talking about oak. Oak plays a vital role in the production of wine and spirits and increasingly in beer. In this special episode, we're going to delve into it more deeply with Darren Lange, founder of leading oak supplier Master Cask. Growing up in the Barossa Valley, Darren has spent his life in and around the wine industry. He has a technical winemaking background, and the last 20 years of his career have been focused specifically on oak, initially as an employee of a leading importer and distributor of French and American oak wine barrels. Darren founded Master Cask in 2010, realising a vision to assemble his own portfolio of French and American oak cooperages. He was instrumental in establishing the Tasmanian Cask Company in 2014 and purchasing SA Cooperage in 2017. These cooperages are producing increasingly specialised barrels for the emerging Australian spirits industry, and it's that area of Darren's expertise that we spend most of our time discussing today. Drinks Adventures will be returning properly for 2020 in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for what promises to be a ripper season five. In the meantime... This is a special episode of the podcast made possible by the support of Master Cask. And I started by asking Darren Lange how the role of oak has changed in Australian wine over the last 20 years. It's changed a lot, you know, as as have the wine styles. You know, Australia through the 90s went through a huge growth period, a lot of opportunity and focus on international uh, markets. But we were a young industry from a table wine point of view. uh, All of this growth and all of this opportunity was quite new. And so we were planting a lot more new vineyards. Um, The wines themselves were probably lacked a little bit of complexity. And I think oak was used as one of the components to try and bring some depth and some three-dimensional complexity to those wines. We've moved away from those styles significantly. Um, You know, the wines themselves back in the 90s were high alcohol, high extraction, high everything, high oak input as well. And we've moved right back away from, from that. And I think Australian wines are now and nev- you know, never been in a better state. Very much about varietal expression, expression of, of place and, and time, you know, the, reflecting the vintage conditions as well and ensuring that the application of the oak is there to highlight that. It plays a supporting role. It's not there as an additive. It's there to bring three-dimensional complexity to the wine, absolutely but always uh, ensuring that the the characteristics of the wine are lifted. Darren went out on his own to launch Master Cask when his previous employer decided to go in a new direction. And in essence, they were going to become competitors of the Coopers that I was working with internationally at the time. And when you're representing barrels, you can't be swapping from, you know, between different brands all the time you become connected i guess with the styles of the cooperages that you're working with and you believe in those styles and you believe that they're important they contribute value to the industry so 
you become intrinsically connected with those, and I didn't want to be uh, through some decisions that were being made in, in the business at the time that I was working for to have that impact on what had been at that stage, you know, 10 years of my life in terms of uh, developing those relationships with those cooperages. Being involved with coopers, it's your life, it's not just a job. Master Cask was initially established to supply oak to the wine industry, but it wasn't long before Darren began developing relationships with Tasmanian distillers through Sullivan's Cove's Patrick Maguire and eventually joining forces with local cooper, Adam Bone. The intention was purely just to build a portfolio of different coopers that bring different uh, styles and different characteristics so that when I'm having those conversations with the winemaker, it's not about me trying to just sell a barrel. Uh, I'm there to listen to what, what the winemakers are looking for in terms of style and texture and all the, all the different things that we consider uh, when we're looking at oak. And so to have a balanced portfolio, high-end coopers in a portfolio for the wine industry was really, that was the focus of the business when I started it. But pretty quickly, I saw the opportunity in the, in the spirits industry. Took my first trip down to, to Tasmania and was fortunate enough to meet um, Patrick Maguire as my very first appointment, who was, who was at that stage, I think, the chairman of the, the local distillers association in Tasmania. And he was kind enough to share some, you know, some contacts with me. And so I spent the balance of that week sort of getting around and visiting most of the, the distilleries that existed at that time, which was, I think from memory was 10 or 11. That was the start of that. And then really it wasn't until 2014, the volumes had grown. There was enough consistency uh, in requirements for barrels in Tasmania. I saw an opportunity to actually uh, be based in Tasmania. I uh, was fortunate enough to meet Adam Bone at the time who had also just started coopering down there, and he'd be in contact with me regarding supplying him oak. So it got to a point where he was buying all of his oak from me and, and pretty much he was coopering all, the, all of the barrels uh, for me for Tasmania, and so we joined those two things together. Before we started recording, you were telling me that the Australian spirits sector is a much bigger part of your business now than wine, which surprised me because the Australian wine industry is huge and we're known for our red wine. Red wine goes into oak, but that's not where the bulk of your business is anymore. Maybe you could explain how that has transpired. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of factors there that drive that. One is that roughly $20 and up is where new oak barrels start uh, to be used in the winemaking process. And typically in those lower price points, it's a lower percentage of new oak. As you go up into more premium wines, the percentage of new oak increases. That's one reason. We say generally it's around 3% of Australian wine actually sees new oak. It's a tiny percentage of the market. That's new barrel. Most wines would be going to barrel. They'd just be going to, you know, to older, either a second fill or a third fill oak. The other thing is that winemakers are looking for so much diversity and complexity that typically in a wine you will have three to four coopers maybe to bring that level of three-dimensional complexity. You're never supplying 100% of one customer, let alone one wine. And if you compare that then with spirits, it's very different. 100% of what is maturing is, is going into, into barrels, so that's a big difference in itself. And so if you compare the industries, I think the Australian wine barrel usage per year in terms of new oak would be around the 60,000 barrel mark, and spirits are probably approaching 40,000 barrels already in a reasonably short period of time. And then when you consider there's, as I said, a lot more concentration in terms of the coopers that are being used in spirits, that's where you get that bigger number in terms of our business, the split between uh, wine and spirits. And when you talk about the style of the different cooperages, how much do they vary? Yeah, it's significant. And there's a number of factors that, that drive that. I mean, the origin of the oak, where the oak comes from, the grain of the oak, so how fast the oak actually grows, is also really important. We say, in a basic sense, typically the tighter the grain, the more oak aromatics, the less tannin is in, in that oak. Uh, and the broader the grain, conversely, you know, you have more, more tannin and less oak aromatics. So that has a big uh, role. I think grain is probably more important than where the oak comes from in terms of its origin. And then you've got the seasoning, so the oak is naturally air dried. That's to adjust the moisture level of the oak. But probably more importantly, seasoning the oak affects the tannins, so you've got microflora moulds and bacteria that grow on the surface of the oak, and that has an impact, that natural microflora has an impact on, uh, on the seasoning. 
uh, and the fl ultimately the flavour and the style of the tannins that you end up with. So the seasoning's really important. How long you season it for, where it's seasoned, how the oak is stacked, all of those things have a big influence. And then you come into the coopering. So coopering itself, making a barrel, doesn't really affect the style or the flavours of the barrel. It's about the toasting, and in the case of spirits, it's toasting and charring or just charring by itself and how that influences the flavours. And then the really exciting part, once you've got a, a barrel, it's then how you apply it. So it's it's a matter of, as I said before, understanding what the winemaker or the, or the distiller is looking for stylistically, what their local conditions are, what the maturation conditions are going to be like, and ensuring then that the application of that oak is very specific to those conditions. So, you know, there's quite a bit, particularly with new oak, that really influences um, and has a big impact on the flavours and the styles of the of the barrel. For example, if you take exactly the same French oak out of the forest and you were to take that to Burgundy and then to Bordeaux and you were to season that oak for the same period of time, you'd end up with completely different flavours and characteristics coming from that exact same oak. And so we've actually got a project that we're working on at the moment with that in mind where we're actually seasoning oak in Tasmania. It's French oak and American oak, so it's not, not Australian, but we believe that we will get a significant imprint on that oak from the microflora that'll grow where we're seasoning that oak. So we've picked a, a location actually down at Port Arthur. Great rainfall, we looked at all the conditions down there and compared it to some of the, you know, the best seasoning regions for, for oak around the world. And we believe that we've, we've got really great conditions uh, down there to, to season, season that oak. So we'll see what we get in, in another 12 months time. It's been there for 12 months as it is and, and we'll look at that again in another 12 months and see what we've, what we've come up with. Had you had much exposure to whisky prior to that point when you saw that opportunity and thought, I'm going to have to start meeting the needs of these craft distillers? No, I've, I've got to say I was probably more a bourbon drinker as a, as a young person. And well, bourbon's whisky too. <laughs> yeah, exactly, no, exactly. But in terms of single malt, no, I didn't, didn't really have a huge knowledge of, of single malt whisky. So it was a real, it was a real learning, uh, an exciting learning process for me, I've got to say. Um, and challenging from a tasting point of view. So with wines, as I was saying before, we, I, I taste probably with, oh, I'd say 180 uh, different wine producers typically uh, every year. Um, and you, you can start at 7.30 in the morning and finish at you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I don't know, in a day, maybe look at uh, well, more than 100 wines, that's for sure. The challenge when I started in spirits and was very eager to sort of follow that same sort of approach, <laughs> I realised pretty quickly <laughs> that it was, it was far more challenging. Um, but it, like anything, your palate develops and you become used to it and you're able to sort of progress and, and see a lot more whisky in a day than what I did when I first started, that's for sure. So up until that point, you'd been dealing in New Oak. Once you started supplying the whisky industry, you were then buying ex-fill casks from bourbon producers and wine producers in Australia and then treating them before resupplying them to whisky distillers. Is, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So obviously we'd had that history with purely with New Oak. We've got lots of relationships with lots of high-end premium winemakers around Australia. So we naturally had those relationships established and were able to source really high quality fortified barrels, tawny and sherry and tokay and muskets and all of those sort of fortified wines. And then naturally we had a relationship there to access, you know, really again high quality wine barrels. Sourcing probably wine casts is the most complicated for a number of reasons. There's so many variables, as I said, with the base barrel to start with, and a lot of those oak variables are still very present and available for extraction into spirits, even though the winemaker at, say, a barrel at six years old would consider them to be neutral. For wine at 14.5% alcohol, you put in a 63% alcohol spirit into those wine casks, and there's a lot more oak and oak flavours there to give to the spirit. So there's all of those variables then play a big role that we mentioned before with new oak. They're still there and present for spirit. And then you've got all the variability of the winery that's had the barrels before, how they've maintained them, what wine styles have gone into them obviously have some influence. To be honest, I think the original aspects of the oak, you know, the style of the oak for the duration of the maturation will actually really be the critical 
uh, definitive factor for what the maturation will look like from those casks as opposed to the wine characteristics. I think the previous fill from a wine component plays a role in the early, early part of the maturation. And if a wine cask is being used as a, as a finishing cask, you'll see some of those, those characteristics from that previous fill come through uh, in the whisky. But for the duration of a, you know, a four year, a six year maturation uh, in a wine cask, the key component or the influencing focus would still be about the original characteristics of the, the oak itself. Tell me what actually happens when spirit goes into a barrel. What are the different processes that occur during maturation? There's only really three components to maturation. So there's the extraction. So whether we're talking about the component of the oak being extracted, whether they're oak flavours or whether they're previous uh, fill flavours. As I said, with wine, given that the wine has only been in there for a short period of time, and probably over the course of its six year life in a, in a winery, it's probably had different wines in it as well. So there's not one, one wine component that would contribute. But with Fortified, that's very different. Obviously the Fortified wines have been in those barrels for a long, uh, much longer period of time. So we do see a, a bigger influence from the previous fill component that comes from either the Apera or the, the Tawny or whatever the Fortified wine is. So. There's only, extraction is one component of maturation. Uh, then you've got concentration. So over the maturation uh, period, you're losing, uh, you're losing water vapour, you're losing liquid volume. Uh, and so you get a concentrating uh, effect of that. So the flavours that you've got there will concentrate over the maturation period. And then you've got the interaction, uh, which is largely chemical reactions that are happening, largely driven by oxygen. Um, and those, those reactions are what is what I consider as true maturation. So they're largely driven by time, as I said. They're certainly driven by the conditions of the bond store. You know, the local conditions of where the distillery is will have a in, big influence on that. Uh, and as I said, time is really the key thing there that drives that maturation reaction with the components of the spirit, with the components that have been extracted from the barrel and then interacting with that oxygen over that period. Now you can expedite the process, obviously, by putting your spirit into a smaller size barrel. The surface area to volume ratio plays a critical role. Is that a practice that you think more characterised the earlier stages of the whisky industry in Australia, or are we still seeing a lot of producers using smaller format oak? Largely, the smaller oak has been used to bring whiskies to the market sooner. There's been some great whiskies, I think, made in, in some smaller oak. It's far more challenging to make a balanced whisky in a small cask. As you go up in size, I guess your window for picking the appropriate time to take the whisky from the barrel, that window gets bigger as you go into larger format. So when you're in small barrels to, to pick that um, spot uh, to take the, the whisky out at maturation is, is much tighter. The other thing that you've got happening is you've got lots of extraction happening because you're in a, you're in a much smaller cask. And so to get, uh, the extraction really happens quite quickly. But to follow that with the maturation, as I was saying before, with the, the role of the oxygen and those interactions, they need time. So to get the balance, to get those interactions to, to take place and to balance and to produce balanced whiskies in smaller casks is far more challenging, no doubt about that. But, but we've seen some good examples of that in the, in the early years. But I think as the industry matures, and we're already seeing that as a cooperage, the, the, the use of 20 litre uh, barrels in particular is, is, I wouldn't say it's completely finished, but it, it's largely, well, it's certainly reduced significantly in the last, last 12 to 18 months. Darren says the use of oak by Australian whisky distillers has changed considerably in various other ways over the last decade. I think in the early days, a lot of focus on port, you know, so ex-fortified port casks, or Australian tawny, I should say, and sherry slash apera uh, casks in Australia were very, you know, so very fortified focus. I think we've seen an increase in the use of single fill bourbon casks, and I think that's a good thing. The single fill bourbon cask, it's not neutral, but in terms of oak extraction, it has less oak extraction than some of the other options, obviously new oak, uh, but also the wine 
barrel casts which are which are being used a little bit these days well more and more these days and um, there's a lot of oak extraction associated with those bourbon casks just by their name i mean they're produced in huge numbers uh, in the states for uh, for obviously for bourbon uh, maturation and they're very homogenous there's not the same level of approach to detail uh, and variations as there is as i explained with with french oak for example for the wine industry they're you know far more generic i suppose that's changing a little as the the bourbon industry premiumizes as well but by and large the, you know the volume of american bourbon casks is produced you know very homogeneously very consistently so the barrel itself is consistent to start with and then it's had you know 80 odd percent alcohol bourbon matured in it so it's extracted a lot of those oak characters from the barrel which you see in a bourbon style whiskey um, so that leaves a relatively consistent bourbon cask to be used for for single malt you know all over the world and and so stylistically what single field bourbon cask what it does is it enables the quality of the new make spirit to remain intact and to shine through in the finished whiskey having said that there's changes in the way that we now use fortified casks the high you know premium uh, single malt whiskies uh, around the world uh, are still made largely you know in particularly sherry casks so fortified casks are still I think very, very critical uh, to the future of whisky maturation generally, but certainly for Australia as well. So that'll be obviously Australian Apera for Australia. That's really critical. And then we're also seeing, as I said, some, some increases in the use of uh, wine barrel casks as well. And then uh, I think even in international markets, increasingly we're starting to see some new oak uh, influences being used either for finishing casks uh, or for in the early stages of maturation for extraction and then put to some second fill or third fill cast for the balance of the maturation. So they're really the, the four key sort of groups, if you like. I think uh, single fill bourbon will underpin a lot of it. It's a very consistent, not neutral base, but it, it provides a, a very respectful barrel as a base barrel for the maturation. So whether then distillers start to look for finishing, various finishing casts to overlay over the, the back end of the maturation to bring some certain characteristics to the whiskies, you know, with individual approaches, um, but using that bourbon barrel as the base barrel, uh, I think we'll see, we'll see a fair bit of that. Um, I think it's interesting, obviously, with the supply of fortified barrels, there's a lot of talk about the continuity of supply for fortified. I think if you look at uh, what's happening in Scotland, largely they are, in terms of their sherry casks, they're seasoned casks out of Spain. They're not traditional casks that have been used for long-term maturation of sherry. And I guess if you think back to history and uh, the casks largely, historically, that were used in Scotland from Spain were actually transport casks. So they weren't necessarily long-term maturation casks either. Everything was exported in bulk um, across to, to the UK and then largely bottled uh, in, in the UK for, for local consumption in, in that market, which meant that there was you know, a residual uh, availability of empty barrels uh, for the spirits industry there. So that was the natural process for accessing sherry cars back in those days. These days, obviously, the fortified mines of, of Spain, the sherries, have to be bottled in country of origin so all of those transport cars they don't exist anymore so there's been a, an industry that's grown up now of seasoning casks um, for specifically for the, the scotch producers and we're very much going to have to go down uh, that that same path which which is a good thing i think ultimately there's some lovely old fortified casks that are that are available absolutely and we'll, we'll continue to work hard to to source those um, from australian producers but there's a lot of variability in that, uh, so a lot of inconsistencies with those casks. So there's opportunities in seasoning casks to control the base barrel that you're using, the quality of the fortified wine that you're using, and then all the parameters associated with the with the with the seasoning of those of those casks. So uh, I think the Scottish industry sees seasoning of casks as a as a progressive um, direction, and I think I think ultimately we'll we'll go down that same path here. So essentially buying fortified wine purely to season your barrels, 
There's not really an end consumer for that product. We'll consume those fortified wines in the in the seasoning process, essentially. Oh, they, the barrel just sucks it up. Yep. Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. But Darren says that in a country like Australia, there will never be a one size fits all approach to maturation for distillers. It's site dependent, and you know we've got such a diverse country uh, in terms of climate and, and you know various you know conditions for for maturation. I don't think there'll be a hard and fast rule on the right size uh, barrel. I think there'll be appropriate um, size of cast for, for different maturation conditions. You know, even the, the building itself, how that impacts on temperature fluctuations, barometric pressure, so depending on where you're located, that has a big influence. Ocean influences, you know, are often talked about. And I think that oak should be there to highlight the characteristics of the new make and to allow those individual conditions, maturation conditions, combined with the new make spirit to dominate and to dictate the style of that whisky. And the oak should be there to highlight that. Yes, to bring three-dimensional complexity and play a role in sort of softening and making the whisky more approachable, but, but ultimately doing that and ensuring that the individual whisky is highlighted, not impacted too much by the oak. What are your thoughts on some of the other brown spirits categories? Brandy, rum, are you doing a lot of work with distillers that are making those products? Certainly rum is very much on the radar. We've started working very, very closely with a number of rum producers. And again, we're in the early stages of looking at their style of new make and how we're going to approach the maturation side of that. They do differ, obviously, for in terms of which oaks and which style of oak and what we need to do even in the cooperage to prepare those oaks for those styles of spirit is, is slightly different. So rum, definitely. Brandy, we haven't seen much action on, and I'm a little bit surprised. We've obviously got many, many of the older wineries, the more established wineries in Australia would still have stills at various stages of commissioning, decommissioning. I think there's a great opportunity for brandy. And then beyond that, I think there's even opportunities much smaller, but I think there's opportunities in gin as well. I think to this point, largely most gin producers, when they're doing a barrel aged gin, apply a cast to it and monitor it really, really closely. And when they feel that the oaks had enough influence, they say, well, well, that's enough. Let's remove the barrel from it and that's what we've got. I think there's opportunities to look much more uh, specifically at the selection of oak. Purchase the barrel with a lot more purpose and a lot more focus for the sort of result you're looking for from the barrel maturation of the gin. I think there's some great opportunities there for sure. That seems to be a recurring theme across everything that we've discussed, which is that, you know, in the earlier days of the Australian whisky industry, you were pretty much working with the barrels that you were given to a certain extent, and now you're treating them as an ingredient in the process and trying to create more custom products that are really going to work much better with the spirit that's going into them across the board. Yeah, absolutely. We really now are focused on really working much, much, much closer with the distiller and understanding the new make and then really working on the sourcing of the oak and how we then cooper and how we then apply those barrels to the maturation process to get the best outcome with the individual spirits that we're working with. It must be exciting to think about what Australian craft spirits could look like in a decade, two decades' time when all of these little pieces of the puzzle fall into place and we start really making the optimal spirits that we can? If anything, I think it'll happen quicker uh, than that sort of time frame. Uh, so yes, very, very exciting. That's good because it means we'll be around to drink it. So. <laughs> <laughs> very, very exciting and, and very dynamic. I mean, it's a very, very dynamic uh, industry. There's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of experimental things happening. It's very exciting times for us as a cooperage supplying the industry and exciting times for Australian spirits generally. Well, that sounds like a pretty good note to finish on, Darren. So thanks very much for joining me. Pleasure. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. 
We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.